Naman. Anyong Hasyo. Namaste. Talo falava. And good evening to all. There are many other languages in Asia and Pacifica, but on behalf of the Kongsla World Mission, I greet and welcome you to this webinar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded with the intention to edit and make it available at a later date. As we welcome all of you in tonight's webinar, we have posed a couple of poll questions on your screen. Please take at most 30 seconds to answer these. We are delighted that you can join us this evening for the first of three EDEA webinars for the Asia and Pacifica regions. In these webinars, we reflect on various ways of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic is part of our life context and it has been called a new normal. But how do we respond and operate in this new normal? How are values and services in the new normal different from those of the old normal? Who benefits? Who are ignored? Should we want to go back to the old normal where for many, the old normal was also problematic? Is structuring of a conversation around normal a silencing tactic? This evening, we have three colleagues reflecting on these questions and other issues related to harmony, health, well-being, justice, economy, church and theology. Wei Wang, assistant professor in the Department of History, Shanghai University, China. Alan Samuel Palana, professor in theology and ethics, United Theological College, Bangalore, India. Gerald West, Professor Emeritus and Fellow of the University of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. Before we hear from these members of the panel, I would like to ask the Reverend Dr. Colin Cowan, General Secretary of the Council for World Mission, to offer a short message on behalf of the Council. Dear sisters and brothers, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And first of all, to thank you very much for making it um, to this webinar to be part of this conversation as we reflect together on this pandemic that has been affecting the whole wide world. This is a difficult time for all of us. The stark reality of this pandemic has revealed so much more. Things that we have struggled with and worked toward for a long time have come now to haunt us. Heightened inequality, depressed economy, broken healthcare system, lack of international will to work together, a world in chaos, a future uncertain. And in the midst of all of this, there are questions being asked about where is God? Where is God in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our dislocation? Where is God in the midst of our brokenness? Where is God amid the over a million people who have died as a, an account of the COVID-19 pandemic? Where's God for the millions who have, infect, who have been infected by the disease and are separated from family and friends? Where's God for the many who live in fear and insecurity at this moment in time? The psalmist reminds us that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we shall not fear, we shall not despair, though the earth be removed and the mountain be thrown into the depth of the sea. There's a sense in which the people of faith hold on to something in the moment of our fear and uncertainty. And when we recognize that those things on which we have pinned our security are cut from beneath our feet, then we must turn to the only source of healing and hope and future. And it is against this background that we gather to reflect theologically 
on the COVID-19 pandemic. To ask where is God in the midst of this? To ask what does, what does our faith say? What is the meaning of faith? What is the meaning of our journey with God and with each other in such a time? And so the people of faith, we do not shun, we do not run away, we do not walk away from our problems, we do not give up in despair. We affirm like Paul that we may be crushed, but we are not, we may be broken, but we are not crushed. We may be in a state of anxiety and uncertainty, but we stand strong and solid because we know that God is with us. The incarnational presence surrounds us and enfolds us. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that um, so many of our colleagues have taken the time to read and reflect and to offer their insights and perspectives meant to strengthen our faith, to shore up our weakness and to give us the confidence that we need as we move forward. We would not accept that life is so broken that the people of God cannot rise. We rise in faith, we rise in hope, we rise in love. We rise to hold each other, to be a source of comfort and inspiration to those who are broken, to lift the broken and to give confident hope that together we can make the future. What was, what is, and what is to come are all wrapped up and tied up in God's plan. So welcome to this EDARE 2020. Welcome to this space. And I trust that our conversation together would increase our faith, would strengthen us on the journey, and would give us confidence for the future. The, the new normal or the unfolding future, as I like to call it, that um, we will be given the confidence for this unfolding future that God has in store for all of us. In the name and on behalf of the Council for World Mission, I greet you and welcome you. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Colin. And thank you for all those who have joined, our participants and our colleagues, whether it's on Facebook or whether you have joined as part of the webinar, I would like to indicate that we are now turned to our panelists and we have three distinguished colleagues with us and they would each speak for eight to 10 minutes. So we listen to all of them. We'd like to remind you that you have an opportunity in a question and answer section there to uh, highlight your questions or in the chat box and that will be collected and we would engage in a discussion to follow after each after the presentations. So our first presenter is Wei on the topic of Chinese philosophy of heaven, human harmony, and the theology of impurity in the Hebrew Bible. So Wei, it's over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So now I'm uh, sharing the screen for the panelists, I hope you can see. Mm, okay, good. Uh, my topic today is uh, Chinese philosophy of heaven, human harmony, and the theology of impurity in the Hebrew Bible. So my question comes from um, this year when the um, COVID-19 cases in China was, was increasing uh, quickly to a very high level. And at that time, uh, Chinese government include traditional Chinese medicine. So hereafter, I will refer it to uh, TCM. So China included the TCM treatments in the sixth ver version of the national diagnosis and treatment guidelines for COVID-19. And uh, um, you can see from the picture, the medicinal drinks were produced, massively produced and distributed to hospitals and to patients. But the thing is, um, TCM medicinal drinks are not um, evidence-based medicine, but it was distributed. Um, 
Oh, oh, and here uh, from the National Health uh, Commission official website today, uh, you can download this guide guidelines for COVID-19, the eighth version. So it was like the, it is the official announcement from the government saying that this TCM treatment is promoted by the government. So my question, my main question is, why in a time with modern medicine, the government would include TCM in fighting against the novel coronavirus? Because those medicines were, this is a new virus and the, the medicine they are promoting is not uh, even have experiments on them, but uh, the government is promoting the medicine and many people in China um, accepted it. So, um, um, so if, if it is not from modern scientific reasons, then we need to understand it from um, other perspectives, from maybe philosophical perspectives. So here I need to explain a little bit about TCM and its philosophy. So TCM basically adopted concepts from Chinese philosophy. Um, here I would introduce two main concepts from Chinese philosophy. One is qi, qi meaning wind or vapor or um, spirit. Uh, it pe permeates the universe and it constitutes matter and causes uh, growth and change. Uh, qi is in constant flux and flow and qi is also the basis of the physical constitution of the human body. So when you refer to the qi in the heart, so you have the heart qi. When you refer to the qi in the liver, you have the liver qi. So it, it is a abstract concept. It's, it, it, it permeates the universe, but it also applies to human bodies. And another very important concept is yin and yang, and many people may be familiar with this term. And yin and yang are opposite forces and also um, complementary to each other. So everything has both yin and yang aspects. So these two con concepts are also apl apl uh, applicable to the human body. So TCM holds that the human body is an organic whole. Um, abundance or deficiency of qi in the human body are the criteria for diagnosis. So ph physiological and both physiological and the mental disorders indicate the unbalance of yin and yang. And also in Chinese, in Asian Chinese classics, it is impossible to separate uh, ideas of human society from nature. So they are the same, the world, the, the, there is no separation between human society and a, a natural um, space. So in that sense, um, heaven human harmony is the general principle of both Chinese worldview and also the general principle of TCM. So if um, the, the principle for healing is to achieve heaven human harmony. So illness, the concept of illness could be, uh, should be understood under the, um, under the principle of this in harmony between heaven and human. So with this explanation in mind, it still cannot help us to solve my problem. Uh, my question in the beginning, why the government tries to apply traditional Chinese medicine into, the, into the, their official announcement of the treatment. Um, so um, I think TCM serves more as a system of social norm than professional healing method. Um, if we go to the Hebrew Bible, if we um, look into the ancient Israelite society, that may um, help us to understand why TCM is adopted in today's um, 
situation. So here, uh, I wanna explain a little bit about um, what I can see from the Hebrew Bible. So uh, concerning the concept of illness and healing, um, Yahweh was conceptualized as the ultimate source for disease and injury, and also the only healer for human beings. And in the Hebrew Bible, illness is the result of a violation of God's established rules and also a, a means of punishment by Yahweh. Or uh, there is another explanation of illness, in, uh, especially in the book of Job, that illness is part of God's plan that human beings will never understand. But you have to believe, you have to, the, you have to believe that God is just. So uh, these are the basic um, concepts about illness in the Hebrew Bible. So considering the writing and the formation of the Hebrew Bible has gone through a long historical period, its authors and editors would surely be aware of other med medical traditions in its surrounding cultures. And we know that from historical research that um, the surrounding ancient culture of the Hebrew world, of the biblical world is, um, um, is like um, po polytheism. So um, in ancient West Asia, there are, um, the, there are many, many gods in their surrounding cultures and each god, uh, different gods were in charge of uh, uh, epidemic disease, diseases or different uh, medical treatment. They provided patients with diagnosis and treatment of different types of diseases and their respective temples were healing places. But um, the Hebrew Bible condemned condemned uh, those behavior. They are not like their neighbors. They condemn divination. They condemn uh, witchcraft and uh, um, communications with the dead. Um, so especially in the priesthood um, texts, the rituals are of great importance in maintaining um, uh, Israel's right relationship with Yahweh. So in ancient Israelite society, the theology of purity urges its society members maintain a good relationship with uh, Yahweh through proper sacrificial system. Um, so here comes to my conclusion. Um, according to the traditional Chinese medicine, illness means the inharmony relationship between heaven and human beings. And in this regard, I think biblical writers would understand the Chinese philosophy of TCM and vice versa. The two can understand each other. Um, that may uh, solve also solve my problem uh, at the beginning, why uh, the government adopted TCM uh, in our um, official guideline. Um, I think it's because of this, this disease is new to the world. So we don't have, uh, um, we don't have the scientific, the so-called scientific treatment. So we go back to the, um, to the old traditions to find ways to solve our new problems. Okay, thank you. That's my presentation. Thank you very much, Wei. Could you stop sharing your screen? Thank you very much. And Thank you for highlighting heaven, human harmony, and we shall come back in terms of a, a conversation later on. I now turn to Alan, who will speak on faith in the time of a pandemic, health justice and faith communities. Over to you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, today, uh, I'm um, highlighting things um, that are consider normal because the question that we are asking ourselves everywhere is what, what is normal? What is the new normal? I think there are these two press releases um, that are significant in discerning uh, what is the pulse 
of our times today, deliberately using the word pulse, though the science of the times is more appropriate, the pulse of the times, since it's to do with health. And health is something that touches us alike. And that is the commonality that, uh, that, that holds the entire world now. That's why there are these two press releases that I would like to highlight, suggesting that uh, we are continuing to live abnormal lives. The first release is from the WHO, WHO chief, uh, who has warned that the present pandemic is not the end. We are saying that as soon as the vaccine is um, founded, uh, everything will be okay. And then we are back to um, what we were, though supposedly in new normal terms. But this pandemic, the WHO is suggesting, is not the end and has asked the world to be prepared for another one. If this is just the beginning, is it perhaps just the beginning? The second press release is uh, uh, far, far more problematic in that um, Oxfam has highlighted that uh, the world's wealthiest countries uh, representing just about 13% uh, of the world's population has already cornered more than half, that is 51% or more of the promised doses uh, of that is leading to um, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine candidate, which means that we have seen this consistent hoarding of uh, medical equipment and also um, access to medical interventions. Uh, and that is why these two releases are, are important. And from this perspective, um, I would like to highlight uh, certain aspects as to whether this is indeed normal at all. That's why it's a challenge for uh, Christian discipleship to be in terms of responsible citizenship that requires that every societal trend is analyzed, especially in healthcare, because that is at the heart of our discussion, especially in this pandemic. And that's why what is the new emerging normal? What is this new normal? Or more properly put, what is the character of the emerging new abnormal in our own context? Because in many ways, this what this pandemic has done is it has stripped and laid bare the very deep structural fault lines of a world. And this has brought to it to the fore yet again, because as uh, we have uh, enumerated that uh, empire takes forever new abnormal forms that are strategically normalized and legitimized as the quote and unquote, the new normal. Uh, and therefore I plead for far more carefulness if we have to use the word, the new normal. Therefore, this danger of familiarity needs to be addressed over and over again. Another thing that has uh, happened, uh, especially in terms of uh, the way in which we uh, have viewed health um, in terms of privileged and underprivileged is that privilege now has a claim to vulnerability because as the death toll in powerful countries amounts, uh, perhaps due to lack of uh, precautions, we, 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 we are hearing uh, how people are flaunting uh, rules um, uh, just in this false notion of, of power that though ironically having access to uh, precautions since these death tolls are rising, now privilege has um, uh, takes um, stakes claim to vulnerability. And uh, when uh, uh, such forms of vocabularies of vulnerability and marginalize become, uh, marginalization become somehow diluted and self-directed to the extent uh, that the spectrum of justice dissolves, into a very unifocal, highly individualized survival enterprise. And we are back to the enlightenment days, back to 
um, uh, the early 18th century, where um, such forms of individualism uh, have given had given rise uh, to a highly capitalistic form of organization everywhere. And that's why is it a new situation where in which new forms of empires will take control is something that we are to uh, uh, be careful of and uh, be attentive to. And therefore, this entire hoarding of medical equipment, hoarding of vaccines, hoarding of resources, um, of all uh, suitable he health uh, interventions um, are legitimized as the public concern of one's own individu individual's aspirations. And that's why each country certainly powerful. And that's why the Oxfam uh, report is important for us in trying to discern how this has pointedly become a highly individualistic affair, though it is supposedly a pandemic. What is the meaning of this prefix pan is something that we have to uh, think about. And, and therefore, um, uh, we have to use uh, certain concepts, at least uh, using Joan Layard's concept of unstory. What are these unstories that are not narrated? Um, uh, and uh, Sione uh, would push this forward, uh, saying, what are these hidden transcripts? Thank you, Sione, for that word. What are these hidden transcripts that uh, we, are to, uh, we are to painfully unpack which is closeted and conveniently shut away fra from this uh, big healthcare discourse where in which lives are to be preserved. Certainly, yes. But to what extent and how is holding um, a way of doing so, where in which vulnerable communities uh, uh, of, um, uh, of the global South and elsewhere, especially in India, uh, the Dalits, the Adivasis, the tribals, the displaced ones, the migrant persons, they are desubjugated. And what Foucault was speaking about as the desubjugation of the subject in this play of the politics of truth is becoming more and more obvious. And finally, just one point, if I do have time, uh, Michael, can I make just a last suggestion? Yeah, thank you. Um, and that's why what is the theology um, uh, of our times that we are to perceive uh, in the context of this legitimization of the new normal and pathologization of the most vulnerable communities, um, especially women, where um, uh, this COVID-19 diagnostic labels and fraudulent COVID certificates um, are used in order to um, target the most uh, one vulnerable people in, in our own communities, uh, especially taking recourse um, uh, to adverse um, uh, mental health acts, wherein which uh, because uh, individuals are pushed to the margin because of their own mental health situations, this is being adversely used. And that is why, what is the theology, uh, what is the challenge to theology in this quote unquote new abnormal? Health is not a static possession, uh, but a life giving orientation in the midst of change and challenge. And just as the divine image finds expression in relationships, health is both rooted in and productive of these life giving relationships. These convictions carry important and challenging aspects wherein which a discourse, as I said often, this discourse of mutuality and vulnerability as um, Amos Young beautifully put this, is one way of moving forward. And possibly in the Q and A, we would have time for that. Thank you, Michael, thank you, over to you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. You were talking about pandemic, playing with pandemic, and not necessarily playing, but in a very critical way. The thought did cross my mind of endemic, and then also syndemic, 
or sine demi of the interrelationship. So I can see some connections, heaven and earth, what you're saying, abnormal, abnormal. And now we move to Gerald. And Gerald, you will share with us on reopening the churches and as reopening the economy, COVID's contribution to the Kairos's, Kairos documents, church theology. Gerald? Uh, Michael, thank you, and greetings to all of you. I'm going to read my introduction in full, the first paragraph, because it gives a sense of, of, of how my paper is structured, and then I'm going to focus in on the, the key arguments. Um, COVID-19 has revealed much about the systemic realities of our world, both at the global level and at the local. This paper probes what the COVID-19 pandemic has in its brief time among us revealed about the contours of what the South African Kairos document called church theology. The paper begins with reflection on the revelatory capacity of viruses with respect to social systems, including theological systems. Both HIV, which we live with still here in South Africa, and the coronavirus, have a revelatory dimension. The paper then goes on to place a particular emphasis on COVID-19 and to take up a specifically economic focus, reflecting on how among many other systems, COVID has exposed the economic inequality of our globalized world and how in so doing, COVID has also exposed the kind of economic analysis that undergirds church theology. This then leads the paper to offer some reflection on the Kairos document's understanding of church theology, followed by subsequent post-Kairos reflections on this theological trajectory, again with particular attention being given to the economic dimensions. The paper then moves to a more detailed analysis of the biblical theological properties of church theology, using the Kairos document itself in the first instance, but also supplementing its analysis with the kindred, the kindred analysis of Walter Brueggemann's notion of biblical theological trajectories, as well as the Ujama centers with which I work, their notion derived from South African black theology of the Bible itself as a site of struggle. These preliminary reflections then lead into some detailed analysis of how COVID assists us to understand more fully the contours of church theology. The paper concludes by reiterating a reformulated version of the Kairos document's challenge to the churches, summoning South African churches to turn away from, repent from church theology towards imagined forms of prophetic theology that might engage the South African state on a post-COVID, belatedly post-apartheid settler colonial, re-envisaged, redemptive, and as redistributive, inclusive, decolonial economic order. Briefly, to say something about the revelatory capacity of viruses. This paper argues for the recognition that economic systems and theological systems are systemically aligned. I also argue that, the, that COVID offers an opportunity never to return to the oppressive order of the economically unequal normal. As Arundhati Roy recently aptly put it, reflecting on the revelatory capacity of COVID in the Indian context, and I quote, Historical, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different, she says. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. However, I argue the pervasiveness of church theology as the preferred theology of the post-apartheid churches and the post-apartheid state constrains whether and how we might walk through this COVID-enabled portal. Coming out to a section on unequal economic systems. 
Though COVID is a global pandemic in ways in which the HIV pandemic no longer is, having been relegated to being an indecent disease, afflicting only gays, intravenous drug users, sex workers, and Africans, COVID has uncovered global economic inequalities, along with related regional and local economic inequalities. Though it is too early to expect careful theological reflection on the economic dimensions of COVID, which is why this EDA webinar is so important, the theology that is being done indicates that the church theology trajectory is pervasive, whether by the churches or the South African state. I come now to the real focus, church theology. The 1985 Kairos document rather remarkably, instead of redeploying old theology, did new theology. And in doing new theology, identified three theological trajectories within South Africa. State theology, the theology of the apartheid state, church theology, the theology of the churches, and prophetic theology the theology of the social movements overlapping to some extent with the churches. Though the emphasis of the Kairos document was on prophetic theology, imagining hopefully this to be the preferred theology of the future, we can now argue that its most significant contribution was the identification of church theology, the preferred theology of the post-apartheid present. The Kairos document identified the following characteristics of church theology. One, it lacks the capacity to provide a systemic or structural social analysis of injustice and oppression. Second, it lacks a related theological strategy or orientation it is unable to take sides with the victims of unjust and unequal social systems. Its orientation is from above, not from below. And thirdly, it is grounded in an otherworldly faith and spirituality that is purely private and individualistic. This was the Kairos documents analysis. Post Kairos, given that the Kairos document itself failed to understand that the Bible itself is a site of struggle. We can, I think, understand that church theology is indeed a biblical theology it's in the Bible, unfortunately. And so I turn now to the contributions of people like Walter Brueggemann and Itumaling Masala, who offer us additional characteristics of what we might call church theology. First, church theology comes from above and is about institutional consolidation and structure legitimation. And second, church theology is the theology of the ruling elite in the Bible and in contemporary society, both religious and secular, where the emphasis is on economic consolidation and control, consolidation and control. Now, what does COVID offer us to add to this picture? COVID too, I'm arguing, has made a contribution, revealing further characteristics of church theology, which became clear in South Africa when the religious sector, beyond the churches, the entire religious sector, but particularly the churches, put pressure on the South African government to reopen the churches when it reopened the economy on the 1st of June, 2020. What emerges out of this particular uh, moment is an additional characteristics of, of church theology. It's an emphasis on ecclesial economic self-maintenance, ecclesial economic self-maintenance doing business as the church, sustaining the church itself. As already indicated, 
My argument is that these cumulative and related characteristics of church theology mitigate against the churches having any economic theological contribution to the South African government's stated vision of a post-COVID new economic order. Our president said a short while ago, clearly this COVID moment, as I say, has given us leverage, the opportunity to usher in a new era. Having failed to radically restructure the South African economy after apartheid, the South African government envisages the post-COVID period as an opportunity for economic redress, belatedly eradicating economic inequality. I conclude. My argument is that not only does the political sector, including the government, not anticipate any theological contribution from the churches towards this post-COVID new economic order, it definitely does not want a prophetic theology, does not want that contribution. It wants the churches to continue to focus on matters of individual and corporate public morality. It wants church theology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerald. So that's an incisive interrogation into your context, South Africa, but also, I, I suspect, in other contexts, in terms of really the need for prophetic theology to take on systemic issues and how at least it's so easy for us to be co opted into what is the dominant voice in our different struggles and so on. So, so colleagues, we, we tried to launch that poll, but we didn't manage. So we'll do that now, to launch that poll now, while I would be in conversation with our, our speaker. So if that poll can be launched now, that'll be brilliant. And we would now give this first opportunity to Wei, Alan, and Gerald to briefly, just briefly, raise any kind of questions, you know, in conversation with each other. So I'm hearing from Wei, harmony and good relationship, you know, health and harmony, I'm hearing from Alan, health and well-being of society, but then juxtapose in terms of what's normal, what's abnormal. And then with Gerald, in terms of church theology and the pervading the necessary means of that Kairos document being used as a lens to scrutinize it. Are there connecting bits that you can identify with, with each other's presentation or bits that challenge each other? Quickly, whoever wants to start um... okay Gerald yeah um, and Michael thank you um, way I, I really found your paper fascinating for the juxtaposition between um, different narratives and Alan picking up your idea of story and the narratives we tell which I found very 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 significant what happened under HIV was that the scientific narrative never really became the dominant narrative uh, uh, religious and cultural narratives around HIV were far more powerful than the scientific narrative. And yet with COVID, we find this massive shift uh, away from local cultural religious narratives to this emphasis on a scientific narrative. I think, I think we need to reflect a little bit more on that and maybe in our different contexts, we'll find different responses. In South Africa, it's very clear that, that, that anyone who doesn't adopt the, the, the scientific narrative is seen as, 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 as not really taking the, 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 the virus seriously. Okay, um, we, you or uh, Alan, would you want to wish to respond or to each other, the conversations you've heard? You don't feel obligated. Anybody wish? To? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think uh, what you said is uh, pointedly true um, uh, in, in that this scientific narrative has as being the most dominant uh, because um, since uh, people were groping in the dark, the only narrative um, that was actually placed was the scientific one. And um, it, it actually was natural that 
uh, people adopted that and, and there was science of, of, of I'm not saying that the scientific is wrong uh, and that the colleagues in the sciences are wrong because of them they have been instructions and, and then um, very many lives are being saved um, but having said so uh, I think the, there is this clinicalization uh, uh, the process of clinicalization over against uh, a far more, more uh, grassroots narrative uh, th that actually held people together, especially in South India, as we see. Uh, what people did was they shifted to uh, quote unquote traditional medicine uh, as um, as opposed to uh, the Western one sin since uh, not necessarily Western, that which is scientific, um, that uh, in terms of uh, pharmaceutical companies taking toll, that did not happen for some reasons. So this particular narrative has not been touched as you have rightly pointed out. Thank you. Thank you. So while I'm waiting for, I, I hope that Malika and, and um, Danny is there because we have invited two colleagues um, to be discussant in this conversation as well. I want a way, if you don't mind, I, I like the input of, you know, harmony and good relationship are important, it seems, from, from the, your presentation. And then I, 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 I thought of, and we are thinking of probably, how might we develop harmony and good relationship in cultures that are competitive? You know, because there is an underlying, within all of the papers, there's an underlying systemic issue about a capitalist model in operation. So would the capitalist model be seen then as a disruption of harmony and good relationship? Way, would you be able to, you know, respond to that as? Um, my, um, I'm, I'm not quite, uh, um, I'm not quite uh, wanna like um, justify uh, like traditional, Chinese medicine treatment or traditional. Uh, um, I think um, we, we, we call it traditional Chinese medicine is, is, um, is because we, we, we always put that um, against the, the, the scientific. Uh, so we, pu we, we put the two in opposition in modern times. But uh, this, now we call it the traditional Chinese medicine. Actually, this is something with us all the time. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, not, uh, in some way, it is not uh, justified to, to give that name, traditional Chinese medicine or traditional um, medicine or seem to be something uh, old, something uh, in, um, in, in the opposite of uh, modern, in the opposite of uh, mo modern, um, in the opposite of uh, uh, evidence-based uh, 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 scientific uh, proved. Uh, um, so um, I think it's uh, it's uh, always from ancient times to modern times is always the uh, represents a way for people to um, understand the world. Um, to solve problems we met. So this is, I think this is what I'm, I'm trying to say. Thank you very much, Ray. thank you very much. Is, I, I would like to invite Monica and um, Sioni because Sioni has been collecting the questions and it, it, Monica, do you have any kind of conversation questions you would like to pose to our colleagues now? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I, I don't have, uh, uh, it's not a question, but I just, uh, well, it's not a direct question, but I just wanted to respond to what uh, Wei just said about traditional uh, medicine, medicine. I think it would be wrong on our part to assume that traditional med medicine is not clinical or traditional medicine is not scientific. Uh, I think you know it rests on the on the wisdom of of the of the uh, of the elders or the practitioners of this medicine who have obviously uh, done some some research of their own or on the basis of wisdom that has been handed over by the previous generation, uh, you know, uh, prepared this medication. So 
um, I know that it's not just in the context of COVID, you take any, any illness for that matter, in a lot of uh, the uh, cultures in, in the global south, you, you have them side by side. I mean, I'm diabetic and I go, I take some, some traditional stuff along with my, with my medicine and my doctor tells me if it doesn't in interfere with your allopathic me medicine, please go ahead, you know. Uh, the only thing is there has been no scientific uh, experiment or uh, study done to determine the exact um, uh, impact that this, uh, these medications have on, on an individual. I don't know if that helps you, Wei, but <laughs> I thought I would, uh, I would, I would say that. Uh, I have a question for, uh, for Gerald. And uh, Gerald, um, I, I, I'm curious about who are the architects of of church theology, you know, uh, or who are the ones who are articulating uh, the uh, the church uh, church theology, and uh, and I, you know, I'm just wondering: is all the church theology status quo? Is there no prophetic element at all uh, within uh, within church uh, church theology? Since maybe representatives of church theology are not here, so I'm just asking on their behalf. <laughs> Okay, uh, Monica, thank you. Um, I, 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 can, I can speak from the South African context, but, but um, it, perhaps also enlarge it to speak across the African context. Um, from, from the 1980s onwards, it became fairly clear that um, within the South African context, um, the dominant form of theology in the churches was church theology as I described it. This focus on the individual, on the personal, on the non-systemic, um, on the on the moral, um, and um, part of the problem is we've had people like Desmond Tutu who give the impression that the churches are prophetic, but but that was a minute strand within the churches. It was never really the dominant uh, position of the churches. Um, not even not even in terms of their own. Um, uh, um, statements, and there's, there's, there's really important work about this. Um, and the so-called mainline churches were, were really accommodating themselves towards apartheid. Um, and so church theology was extremely pervasive, but there was always this very vibrant um, uh, fringe of the church, edge of the church, uh, prophetic theology, which also connected the church with the social movements, which was really where the prophetic theology was based. Uh, black consciousness, for example, uh, was, a, was a social movement in which, in which prophetic theology was being done. What is interesting is that across the African continent, um, there wasn't the same kind of contestation uh, in the public realm between theology. Church theology dominated across the African continent. What is alarming is that South Africa has now joined the rest of the continent. It's very hard now to find any form of prophetic theology. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Gerald. And, and I don't want you to answer this, but if you can think as at some point we can have that in the conversation in terms of whether within churches there are bits that one can be labeled prophetic, even though it is not necessarily prophetic in the sense of addressing its systemic issues and the large issues. Just contemplate that for later on. Well, Alan, I'll come to you before I go to um, Sioni, who would bring in questions from, from, from Facebook and from chat. I mean, in your larger paper, which I've read, you spoke about mutuality and vulnerability. And you, I mean, I like that if you are normal, you know, not that I like it, but I, I understand the play and so on. And you also mentioned about the complexity of stratification. And it, it, it clicked for me that, Sometimes whether, and I don't think you're articulating that, whether complexity can also be a cop-out of not dealing with what the issues really are. I don't think you're saying that. But the bit about mutuality and vulnerability, I'm wondering if you can respond to the fact that usually these are concepts that those of us who come from privileged position can play with these concepts and say, you know, we need to go towards mutuality and vulnerability, whereas for most people, the normal has always been vulnerable to the extent of dying. And whether 
because the playing field is not level. So I wonder whether you can contemplate a bit on that and respond now, and I then turn to Sioni. Thank you, Michael. I think there, there, there are problems certainly associated with it because um, uh, when we come with this uh, uh, the safety bubble that we are in, uh, it becomes really hard to um, actually um, in many ways de-shell ourselves in order to see whether these work. Um, uh, having said so, I think uh, um, uh, the point I possibly have to make it clear is that this uh, the word called vulnerability is being subsumed or taken by uh, privilege now because it is health, it is a matter of health. A and then when uh, people do die, somehow death appears to be a common ground uh, uh, for, for everyone. And, and since um, it is to do with ill health and death, a privilege can stake claim to vulnerability. Uh, and that is something that we need to decipher uh, and, and also point that, as you rightly said, it's not the same um, uh, uh, level playing field at all. Uh, I think we need to see shades of illness and shades of death, layers of death, layers of, uh, and death is not an equalizer, not at all, even in death even in death, uh, uh, the way in which people have, have been disposed of without any dignity at all um, is something that we need to perceive. Uh, and that's why I argue for uh, uh, mutuality. And mutuality, uh, of course, uh, borrowed from, as I said, uh, Amos Young's uh, um, concept. Uh, but I think uh, some way of mutually holding ourselves that at the depth of, of all of us is uh, is relationship. Uh, and uh, this relation can, can, can only happen where in which uh, stratification is questioned in all forms. Knowing that systemic injustice, I think G Gerard was right in saying how church uh, theology ha ha has somehow um, imbibed that, you know, in terms of the or economic way of looking at, uh, no, um, business way of looking at uh, COVID-19 and seeing it as an opportunity especially in churches is something that I like. Uh, and that's why we need to pursue that uh, mutuality is not necessarily seen um, uh, in terms of privilege because privilege holds uh, now staking claim to vulnerability. And that's why we need to be far more careful in analyzing um, uh, what are these systemic injustices in our own context, in, in our, my own context if I may pursue, because there was a question on um, eco-theology. I'll probably come to that if there is time, Gione. Okay. Thank you, uh, Thank Thank you, you very much, um, Alan. Sione, would you? Thank you. Uh, there are several questions. Um, I'll, I'll keep on putting Wei on the line, um, on the spot. Uh, Wei, there, there are, and so, some of the questions towards Wei has already been answered in, in the discussion so far. But I think there are two, uh, two other questions that, that it would be good if you can comment on, uh, Wei. Yes. One is, how, how do you see any, are there any connection or how would you negotiate between the yin and yang philosophy, which is a relational and or the other extreme is dualistic, and the Christian and other monotheistic faith? what seem to be kind of uh, superioritist, you know, this is the right thing. There's no space for yin and yang. Is there any way you can negotiate that or reconcile them or however you look at them? Uh, the second question is, uh, the TCM is about heaven and human. Uh, uh, is there any human and human? kind of philosophy that en encourages people to live peacefully in a human-human and not just a heaven-human relationship. Thank you, Wei. Thank you, Sio Wei. Um, thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, uh, Sio Um uh, So first, um, to reconcile uh, the dual dualism of yin and yang and uh, the monotheist uh, faith. Um, in, from my perspective, I think yin and yang, these are abstract concepts concerning the um, 
aspects of things. It's not uh, it's not transcendental. It not it not. It, uh, I mean, uh, there are two concepts. So um, they are not two gods. They are just two abstract concepts concerning things. Everything has yin and yang aspects, and the whole universe has yin and yang aspects. Um, so in that sense, uh, even though I I do not really like the term monotheistic, um, but I would say that uh, uh, Chinese philosophy is uh, you can you can understand Chinese philosophy in some in some monotheistic uh, way, um, like uh, the only transcendental um, being is heaven, but yin and yang are only the aspects of things. Like the sun is uh, represents uh, yang and the moon represents yin, but they are not two gods, sun god or moon god. This is not uh, um, this this is not the case in Chinese philosophy. Um, these are the different aspects of things in the universe. Um, so I think there is no conflict between this yin and yang um, concepts and um, monotheistic faith. So this is this would be my response to the first question. And uh, as to the second question, um, I think uh, the TCM um, has uh, the, the TCM was uh, based on uh, heaven human harmony, this principle of heaven human ha uh, harmony. Uh, but the, in Chinese philosophy, we do have uh, um, ethics, ethics concerning human human relationship in Confucianism, in Taoism or Buddhism, in different uh, traditions, Asian Chinese traditions, they have different. Um, ethical um, teachings concerning human-human um, relationship, and they're different. So um, they, they have different traditions to deal with that. So I won't uh, get into that uh, for, for, for answering the second question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wei. So um, Sioni, before you come with another question, I'll go back to Gerald about this idea of um, the prophetic there are elements of uh, prophetic ministry because, you know, and the reason why I asked the question is, I remember the late um, General Secretary of the of Churches, Philip Potter, um, with his stint in Haiti, speaking of the idea of biblical realism, you know, like for instance, when Asians translate the, the verse in the Bible with, with God, all things are possible because of their existential reality in French Creole, they translated something to the effect with God, we can dégagé, which means we can go with God. Not all things are possible. We can make do and was considered a kind of a prophetic move in terms of the context you're living in. So uh, the question I'm trying to push here is that, um, is there an element that's prophetic within church theology? Um, Michael, thank you. Um, I think that's a profound question. Um, the, the way I would respond to that is to say that within the ordinary theology of the churches, and I notice I'm, I'm not using church theology, the ordinary theology of the churches, the dominant, the dominant shape, this is a very important word in, in South African um, theological analysis, theology has a shape. Um, this, this comes out of Albert Nolan's work in the 1980s. So that the dominant shape, and, and, and in my analysis, I've given you the shape of, of church theology. The dominant shape is church theology. Around that are there fragments uh, which don't have a shape yet, but which are prophetic. I, I think they are. I think they are. And, and the problem is they don't have a shape. And, and, and unless you have um, social movements and, 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 and theological movements, which which give those fragments a shape, you don't have any contestation uh, sort of in, in, in a formal sense with, with church theology. Okay. So, so there are fragments waiting for a prophetic shape. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio. 
Thank you. Sioni? Got let, me, let, me, let, let me follow that up, uh, Gerald. There's, there's another question here about church theology. And the, 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 the flow of the question is, has the church theology in South Africa changed or moved? Because there is a time when church theology was behind or supporting apartheid uh, in South Africa. Has, has things, has the church moved? And how is that shape? Thank you. Um, Sioni, thank you. I, I think perhaps the most, the, the clearest shift is that where there was overt contestation within the churches between state theology, church theology, and prophetic theology, these were, these were theologies of the church, right? Um, that contestation is no longer there. Church theology is the, the dominant theology. It's pervasive. There's almost no contestation in the church uh, of, of church theology. State theology has disappeared. Why? Because the state has embraced church theology. But the nature of that church theology has shifted. And, and a key moment, um, um, and our colleague Vuyani Vellum, uh, who, who CWM people will know well, has written about this rather profoundly, that, that we, we made the mistake as a prophetic movement the prophetic theological movement to enter into solidarity with the liberating government instead of remaining in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized. And we were co-opted in a way. Prophetic theology was co-opted, if you like, by the liberatory government. And the liberatory government, as Itumling Masala warned us, has simply co-opted the prophetic movement and, and, and has turned the prophetic theological movement into a church theology movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerald. Um, Alan, you had wanted to respond to a question you saw on um, eco, something about the environment or climate. Is that all? Awesome? Yeah. Is that all? Right. Very good. I think there was a question um, that was raised as to what would be the ecological implications if, for at least in India. Uh, there were two bills uh, that uh, was brought by the government as this, um, uh, this situation was emerging. At one, one side, there was this huge uh, public health challenge. But on the other side, parliament was producing uh, bills against farmers two bills that actually were brought up, which became um, acts, well, was one was the Farmers Producers um, Trade and Commerce Act. And the other one was the Price Assurance Act. Uh, when we look at both of this, this really targeted far, um, marginal farmers. Uh, and um, uh, this has hu huge implications for how e eco theology is being done in India, uh, to see how both these movements, one having a pandemic to take uh, to, uh, the challenge of the pandemic, the other one was how marginal farmers became even more marginalized at the same time during the, this very time, uh, having these two acts um, together. And that's why these important junctures are to be discerned as to how, uh, going back to what Michael was actually questioning me, what are these uh, stratifications uh, that we are talking about and what are these layers? Uh, not just have to be unpacked, uh, but rather to be distilled within um, uh, the way in which um, uh, government uh, works uh, alongside, okay, uh, alongside uh, with the most powerful um, uh, in order to uh, subjugate the masses even further. Thank you very much, Alan. Sioni? Yeah, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll push it a little more uh, in, in terms of the question because we, we've been talking about health and well being and harmony in terms of humans. Yeah, what does this, what does this mean in terms of ecology? What, what is normal or what is abnormal? And can we think theology or think church beyond the harmony for humans? Um, and, and that's not just for you, Alan, but, but for others on, on the panel. Um, thanks, Michael. 
Thank you. So um, would, would um, someone want to join in there? It's specifically to Alan. Well, it follows up on what Alan's contribution, but it's also for all of us, all of you on, on the panel who would like to take a shot at that. I'll try and briefly uh, respond uh, to CNA. Thank you very much, CNA. Um, uh, this uh, Trinitarian formula that we had always kept in terms of God, human, and and world uh, when we are doing eco theology, uh, we need to discern. Um, within the human, what are the shades of human that we are talking about? Uh, there are parts of humanity uh, which actually integrate itself with nature. And those are, are the most vulnerable communities that we are talking about. Um, uh, uh, eco-theology, at least dominant eco-theology in India ha has only somehow confined itself with creation, not seeing the human part um, uh, the human implications of creation, wherein which yes, creation ought to be, but but then um, uh, such kind of dominant eco theology is also evident in, in the government government way of actually in in the guise of actually protecting nature and uh, displacing um, uh, communities uh, uh, who were actually part um, uh, or, or of such uh, places in nature as well. So we need to be more careful when we see, especially within the Indian context, as how we uh, see this word called human. Uh, do we need? Uh, we, we need to um, uh, find more vocabulary in order to decide what this human is all about. Again, uh, human can also mean the privileged ones as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Um, Monica and um, any other member of the panel, you want to follow up on that or any other um, uh, points that have been raised thus far? Something that stirred you, got you going, or thinking? Otherwise, um, Sioni, if you have a um, Yeah, there are, a few, there are a few other questions, uh, Michael, and, and I hope this will not get you into trouble way, uh, but, but many of us outside of China um, are curious how things are within China. So one of the question is, is about what's going on, uh, especially with the, with the Christian church. What, what's the Christian church doing uh, for the people? And on, for the other uh, members of the panel outside of China, how do we deal with this tendency, this hatred uh, that is rising against China? You know, the president of the United States uh, blamed this virus on China, Wuhan, and there's uh, bigotry and mongering uh, going against China. How, how do we deal with that uh, as, as people of, of good faith or goodwill or uh, so there are two sides to, to there, I mean, there are several questions in this line, what's going on within China and how do we, how do we clean our, uh, find harmony in our heads <laughs> towards China? Okay, we have oh. some minutes. Okay, go ahead. We... Oh, uh, okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, I, um, I, I would share with you that um, I think, um, we cannot uh, eliminate hatred. Hatred is uh, complicated. Uh, um, there are a lot of uh, political re reasons behind that. Um, but inside China now, um, you know that we have a quite centralized government and a strong government. Um, so with very um, strong uh, policies, uh, we in, inside China now um, the the pandemic is uh, is under control. Um, most of the cities um, is safe, and uh, our university opens, so we we teach in the normal uh, classroom, uh, almost back to almost back to the old normal. Only that um, uh, people cannot travel easily uh, internationally. 
Um, but inside China, it's more, it, it's almost uh, as the old days. Um, as for the churches now in China, because we have this strong centralized government, um, the churches is, most churches, I think they are um, um, with the government. So they would, uh, um, in, in their, in their regular preaching, they would, uh, um, they would uh, say that uh, uh, we agree with the government, the policies of from the government. So we all uh, follow the instructions from the government, um, so that uh, everybody would keep keep safe, so to speak. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure that if. Uh, strong government like this is good or bad but uh, <laughs> but for the time being it is really difficult to argue that uh, um, the, go the government is bad <laughs> and also uh, with this new situation in the world um, the the Chinese government the central government and also um, most of the Chinese people have we have so much confidence in our um, system, in our political system, and in our um, ethnicity pride? Pride. I'm not. I'm again. I'm not so sure if it is good or bad for 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 us. But uh, this is the case now. Thank you, Wei. Thank you very much. Um, so we have about four minutes left. Is there any other? Question. Otherwise, we move into your benediction. <laughs> no, do, do others? I mean, Gerald. The, Gerald, uh, any, any final thought? word? Any final word from our colleagues, contributors? Much food to, for, for us to think there was challenging thoughts and um, interesting insights, very good insights. May, may I ask a, a small question uh, to Gerard? Um, Please do. I'm, yeah. <laughs> would, you, would you explain to me uh, briefly about uh, um, state theology and uh, uh, church theology? Good question. Wei, well, thank you. Um, South Africa was in, I think, a fairly unique position um, since the, the 1940s of having a, um, a very clear um, form of what was called state theology. In other words, the, 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 the apartheid state was rooted and grounded in a theological argument. And the Bible was used extensively. Um, you'll be familiar way with, you know, passages like Tower of Babel, for example, uh, this was used to say God does not want people to be together. God wants people to be separate. Uh, apartheid means separateness. That, that's what the Afrikaans word means. Um, so notions of separate development. Um, and so you had this very powerful um, state form of theology, which was also, of course, overlapping with so the, the, the very people who were in government were also church leaders. So you had, you had a very powerful state theology. With liberation in 1994, state theology collapsed almost immediately. Um, and we don't, we, we really don't have a new form of state theology, I don't think. My analysis would be that instead of state theology, the state has embraced church theology. It suits the current state to embrace church theology because church theology does not talk back to the state. The state does not want prophetic theology because prophetic theology challenges the state. Thank you very much, Gerald. Thank you. Thank you. See you, there's, there's a question that just came in. Oh, we have um, a minute left. What is it? Okay. I'll just put it directly to Gerald. Yeah. So what is the prophetic voice that theology can have in pandemic threats like we are in. So what's the prophetic voice that theology can have now for the pandemic, Joe? Okay. 
So I think I think this is what the day this this e day forum is about, right? It's about how do we do theology prophetically at this time, and and again I would come back to notions of of shape and notions of process. What was significant about the Kairos document was the process that developed it. It it came from below. It came out of what people refer to as people's theology. People's theology became prophetic theology. So people like, like you and me, and those of us sitting on this, on this forum, um, who are biblical scholars and theologians, our, our, our location is among the people to, to engage the raw lived theology that is emerging uh, under COVID and to uh, look for ways in which that might be articulated into some kind of public theology. You know, there's given a shape a prophetic shape. And, and I think that's the challenge. So I don't, I think it would be wrong to think of prophetic theology as something that we take from the past and apply it to a new context. It has to be constructed in the moment, in this new, that's what, that's what Kairos means. It's, it's a moment. It's, it's this, this critical moment. So the critical moment is upon us to do theology, not to apply stuff we've got from the past. We can, I think, use uh, processes and notions of shape and the tools that we we've, we've, that come out of liberation theology, black theology, contextual theology, feminist theology, etc. We can draw on those tools, but we've got to do theology in this moment. Thank you very much, Errol. Thank you. This discussion is going to continue. I think you're right. This is the this is why we are having this forum idea because it's uh, where we critically engage with the issues that are before us that are urgent and as we discern where we are being led and called and what are the resources we can draw on. And so to bless us as we leave and go out, I'll call on the poet in resident. Is Mariana here or Sioni, you would be the poet in resident? I think I'm the reserve, Michael. Okay, so we call on the uh, reserve poet in resident or poetic benediction. You may wish to explain to colleagues what this is about. Uh, we decided not to have a traditional prayer or traditional uh, benediction, but to have a poet to offer some thoughts in, in response to the presentations. And the poet that we had invited is not able to join us. And I'm standing in with a piece that I've titled Out of Breath 2. Out of Breath 1 was a poem that uh, the late Teresia Teaiwa uh, read to a group of uh, activists in 2014 uh, about supporting islands in the Pacific that are still under occupation. Uh, that was out of breath one, and this is out of breath two. I form words in order to share some thoughts with you, in order to share my feelings with you, in order to share our spirit with you. I form words out of breath, and you left me out of breath. I form words and I will take a stand upon your words. Your words give me breath. Your words give me thoughts. Your words give me feelings. Your words give me spirit. Your words, harmony, chi, yin, yang, purity, impurity, leprosy, balance. Your words, kairos, recovery, reopen. Consolidation, legitimation, leverage, your words, and story, crisis, public, private, welfare, health, faith, well-being, change, your words, leave me breathless. And breathlessness adds another color to my face. I can't breathe. Those kinds of words make me oblige. But obligations are easily shifted. Yet for me, your words, your breaths are obliging. Uhambetnami, walk with me, those kinds of words give me breath. I form words in order to share some thoughts with you, in order to share my feelings with you, in order to share our spirit with you. I form words out of breath and you have left us with words to breathe. Amen. Amen. 
colleagues, I like to thank you very much. Thank you, the speakers, for your input. And thanks to you, the audience, for joining us this evening. And we look forward to you joining us at the next session, if you're able to. So the Asia Pacifica webinars will continue at the same time tomorrow, the 30th of October, with presentations from Beverly Haddad, Ajay Sanjay, and Volker Kuster. Please join us. And note also that the EDA webinars for Africa and Europe and for the Caribbean and Americas, the information and the directions are available at eda.cwmission.org. Mission, CW and you may also join those if it suits your time zone. And this recording will be available later. Blessings. Thank you.